Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, I welcome you to the first one of our series webinars, Measurement-Based Care. This is a new initiative we just started within the CTN Data Science Task Force. And uh, how fortunate that we have Dr. John Rush with us, and uh, he has been passionately uh, in developing, advocating the measurement-based treatment. MBC for depression and the related disorders for many years. So he naturally is one of our uh, member of our uh, visionary team. Over the past couple of months, we have developed a strategy of moving this forward to develop this MBC for substance use disorder and uh, at this moment for the OUD disorder. And uh, we asked Dr. Rush to kick off this series of webinars to give us insights about what is MBC and why it is uh, long overdue that we must start uh, this initiative right away. Uh, Dr. John Rush is no stranger to many of us, especially with those who uh, developed the uh, PROUD study who is adjunct professor, holds several professorship at National University of Singapore, Duke, and Texas Tech. He has authored over 800 professional publications on the diagnosis, treatment, biology, psychology, and the systematic clinical care of persons with mood disorders. I experienced that because when we were looking into the literature on the MBC concept, you know, you cannot not look into his paper. Uh, as a clinical researcher and a practitioner, he is dedicated to advancing science to serve patients who are afflicted with these and related conditions and their families. He was the PI of the Texas Medication Algorithm and the STAR-D project, both of which employed measurement-based care. He was recognized as one of the world's most influential scientific minds by Thomas Reuters in 2014 with prior clinical and research experience with SUD patients. Dr. Rush now is consultant to the CTN, actually been a uh, consultant to us for a number of years. Uh, very fortunately to have his assistance in our CTN program. Without further ado, Dr. John Rush, please take the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Betty, for that very kind introduction. I, I am especially pleased to have a chance to talk about measurement-based care because I believe it really is where the, um, the future of psychiatric and mental health, substance abuse, uh, addiction treatments uh, are. So I'm going to walk you through a, a presentation that will hit some of the high points providing a rationale for and some experience with and evidence for the value of measurement-based care. I'm going to rely largely on depression. That's the area that I know well. Uh, there are studies going on in other areas, and I think the principles are applicable literally from across all of the conditions. So I'm going to move fairly quickly, and I'll stop in the middle for some uh, quick questions, perhaps, if uh, they're on your mind. So write them down as we're going along and I'll move fairly quickly here. So these are my disclosures for the uh, last uh, year. I consult with a number of uh, individuals, organizations, divisions, companies, and academic entities. Uh, one disclosure that's very important is the inventory of depressive symptoms and its variations that includes a quick inventory of depressive symptoms is owned by the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and when they sell that, license it for use to for-profit companies, I do receive through uh, UT Southwestern a royalty. It, on the other hand, is freely available to clinicians and practitioners who do not charge the patient who are not operating in for-profit entities. So we're happy to have it as widely distributed as possible uh, gratis. So I want to actually talk about, uh, to illustrate the how parts of measurement-based care, because measure, measurement-based care is a, a set of tools or an approach that really aims at helping clinical decision-making, whether it's improving diagnosis, titrating or personalizing 
medication or actually managing and referring people into and out of various components in the cl uh, uh, clinical care treatment programs. And I think uh, having taught with this as a context, I've been impressed that it's very valuable to training both psychopharmacologists and uh, psychotherapists in improving their management of patients. The definition is, is goes beyond simple measurement of symptoms and adjustment of treatment, although that's a common component of measurement-based care. It's really using any standard clinical tools and a systematic approach or set of processes to accomplish any of the myriad of clinical tasks that are uh, listed here from early detection uh, to side effect management to uh, relapse uh, prediction and, and so on. So think about all of the clinical tasks that we have to undertake as listed here and ask yourself, would measurement help us in a, in a better way than if we simply use clinical impression? And I think just logic alone would tell you, yes, measurement will improve our ability to determine what level of function the person has whether or not a treatment might be indicated or even contraindicated, and certainly uh, tailoring the doses to suit individuals who are highly variable in their response to medications. Finally, of course, we need to think about multiple treatments and their sequencing or combination because no one treatment in substance use disorders, depression, schizophrenia, et cetera, is a panacea. So we often have to, it's a trial and error kind of approach, although perhaps one day improve with uh, clinically useful biomarkers. I think we'll see that uh, actually fairly, uh, fairly quickly. The history of measurement-based care actually goes back a long ways. Uh, Hamilton in 57 came up for depression with the first depression rating scale back in 67, the Montgomery Asperg in 78, our own is in 86, and uh, PHQ in 99. Um, and indeed, once we had criteria set out uh, in 72 with the Washington University criteria, then research diagnostic criteria, and then finally in the DSM uh, in 1980, the first criterion-based set of diagnostic uh, rules or categories was put forth. Once you develop those kinds of criteria, now you have a basis for measuring outcome. Uh, it was recommended in the AHCPR guidelines for depression in uh, 93, as well as in the APA guidelines in the same year. Um, and then it was subjected to um, evaluation in the Texas Medication Algorithm Project. Um, details were defined and applied in the STAR-D project. And then uh, recently, and I'll go over a couple of these uh, reports, the German Algorithm Project and a very recent report from Shanghai, all showing uh, the value of measurement-based care in terms of not just quality, not just uh, quality of care, but actual symptomatic outcomes uh, and uh, modification of side effects where appropriate. So the rationale is threefold. First, MBC helps us communicate and collaborate. Secondly, and I'll show you data on this, it improves the quality of care and outcomes. And we'll talk a little about if we have time on care delivery and system management, which measurement-based care can also be very helpful with. So looking at the communication and collaboration argument, as you see here, uh, reading through the slide, enhanced decision making is, is promoted because there's a common language or more precise metric. Um, and as you know very well, when you say to some patients, how are you doing? Some will exaggerate, some will underestimate, some are stoic, some are uh, exaggerators. But by having a measurement tool, a common language that has uh, agreed upon definitions allows for a more precise uh, communication. It also helps patients understand what it is they're being treated for and whether or not the treatment is working. Because at the end of the day, if the, if the patient isn't better and they know they're not better, they can help us revise our treatment and improve things. I have sometimes said that measurement-based care is a tool that we give patients so they can tell us that we're not doing as well as we should. If you don't have that kind of communication opening, uh, when you say to a patient, how are you doing, there's a demand characteristic in that for them to say, I'm doing pretty well, even if they're not, because they don't want to get into a fight with a care provider. Measurement-based care opens that communication and says, hey, I really want to know how well you're doing. Tell me if it's not good because we can always do something. 
Um, their other uh, rationale is quality of care for uh, and, and improving outcomes. And in that regard, there's clear evidence that measurement-based care enhances the reliability of diagnoses. What, what I mean by that is uh, structured interviews as opposed to diagnostic impressions. We know that we can tailor doses, adjust them better. I'll show you some data on that. And uh, that improves the probability, and it's been shown it does improve it uh, for functional outcomes as well as symptomatic uh, outcomes. In addition, a major problem, at least in depression, is underdosing. And by using measurement-based care, where both side effects and symptoms are um, evaluated, the prescriber feels much more certain about raising the dose when tolerable or holding the dose when they've reached the maximum tolerability, and they're convinced that's where they should remain at least to see how the outcome of treatment uh, actually is or you know, comes out. And finally, it's very important that currently in our care systems, we are moving patients between one provider and another, even in the same clinic. It's very difficult for patients to recall precisely how good or bad a particular treatment was, even if it's just a few weeks ago. And if you read chart notes, it's very difficult to figure out how the patient was really faring under another doctor's care. So by entering measurements into the record, we have a much more clear-cut benchmark for what, what did the treatment do and how did the patient do uh, over time. So it makes communication and care management much higher quality. And finally, I really want to enhance, emphasize enhance, uh, the enhancement of clinical decision making. Because at the end of the day, if the patient is not on board with what's being uh, offered and participating in the management of their condition, they're likely to either not adhere or drop out of treatment, and we lose engagement. Um, it turns out that this, again, becomes a very nice metric for having that uh, collaboration. And it does have some of the other side effects, like reducing attrition, at least in some studies, enhancing adherence, and reducing anxiety. Uh, the pushback from patients is actually nearly non-existent. They actually like it and feel that they want to use the measurements, uh, even when they're not seeing the physician, at least in depression care, to monitor how they're doing and determine when to call back and call for help. In terms of care management, obviously, if one is documenting outcomes, whether symptoms or function or diagnoses, that really helps the care system be responsible for and aware of what is going on and to identify individuals who have problems and may need a specialty referral or second opinion, et cetera. And uh, there is evidence, actually, in inpatient studies that uh, measurement-based care reduces cost, uh, an important ingredient in the care system. So very quickly, first, evidence that measurement-based care improves diagnosis. And this is a study, one of several that have been done of structured interviews. Uh, and it's well known that they have an advantage in terms of thoroughness and reliability. They can be administered, administered by staff and confirmed by diagnosticians that they do add time to establish a diagnosis, but I'll show you some evidence that they may be very important, at least in the major psychiatric illnesses, to be considered either at the outset or when the first treatment doesn't seem to work and perhaps the diagnosis then needs to be revisited. So this is a study we did some time ago in the public sector in Texas we went about diagnosis in three different ways. We created a gold standard with a structured clinical interview, the SCID, plus a look at the chart, the patient's record, and a diagnostic interview by a diagnostician. That was, that was the, quote, correct diagnosis. Uh, and then we looked at patients who were being seen in uh, outpatient care in the community mental health center, and we compared routine chart diagnoses, what was already recorded, versus skid diagnoses, what came out of the structured interview, versus the uh, gold standard. And I'll just show you real briefly what we found. In the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, bipolar 1, or major depression shown here, you can see the sensitivity and specificity of the routine approach. That's what's in the chart, the structured interview, and then the combination. And the combination clearly, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, is preferred. And and you notice that the routine diagnoses 
is under detecting conditions, and these are serious conditions, bipolar one, uh, major depression. We found similar things when we looked at schizoaffective and schizophrenia. I won't show you all that uh, data. The second question we asked along the same lines and roughly the same setting is, <clears throat> if we actually give feedback as to what the, di uh, the structured interview shows, will the psychiatrist change diagnoses? And what we found was, indeed, they would over the subsequent three months, 10 times more likely to make a clinically significant change. What that means is a uh, change from schizophrenia to bipolar, bipolar to unipolar, et cetera, um, and two times more likely to update the diagnosis itself. About 20% of the psychiatrists versus only 2% of the psychiatrists without skid feedback, uh, sorry, the 20% with skid feedback versus 2% without change the diagnosis. So this is a major effect. Uh, one in five psychiatrists found it useful and actually changed the diagnosis. So brief overview of structured interviews. There's lots of data in this regard. I just showed this as an example, but the, the evidence is really quite clear. Structured interviews are very, very important because they identify issues that may not otherwise surface and they can correct and modify key diagnoses that will then change actually the treatment plan or algorithm that the patient will uh, undergo. However, as you well know, it's difficult for us clinicians to change, and uh, this is unfortunate because the evidence on structured interviews is 20 to 30 years old, so I think we need to re-examine these assumptions, particularly in patients where our intervention is not working very well. Let me move to the quality of care and outcomes. I'll spend a little more time on this uh, element. And the first question is, does measurement-based care actually improve the quality of care or outcomes? And the rationale here is basically to try to maximize both, but not run into intolerable or life-threatening or risky or off-putting side effects. So the idea is to use the measurements to adjust the tactics in dosing the timing, the timing of elevation and whether or not to even uh, treat the side effects, and, and, et cetera. So this is uh, a common problem because the majority of people in primary care and a substantial number in psychiatric care do not push the doses up to a level that will maximize the medication effect, and they settle for uh, better but not well when well is a, is a, is a realistic possibility. So measurement-based care can help us with that, and I'll show you the data on that. So we talk about strategies, that's what to do, or what types of treatment, and then tactics, how to actually implement the treatment. And both what to do and how to do it will affect outcome, and measurement-based care can inform both when to do what and how to do the what that you've chosen, the particular treatment. Tactics clearly affect the efficacy and tolerability, and as I mentioned, an inadequate dose or an inadequate duration of trial or a um, off-putting side effects to which the patient then adapts but consequence to which the dose is not elevated leads to a suboptimal dose and a suboptimal outcome. That's been fairly well established. Um, why do we need measurement-based care if we already know how to use medications from Registration trials, well, the fact is that registration trials generally do not include people that we see in practice. In fact, in a uh, study from STAR-D, we found that uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of the patients in STAR-D would not have been eligible for efficacy trials for FDA purposes. This is not unique to, de to depression or psychiatry. It's also true in general medicine. And the reason is quite clear. One wants to promote as much as possible internal validity, which means you limit generalizability. So people with comorbid conditions, people that are highly suicidal, of course, don't enter a placebo-controlled trial. People that have not done well in several treatments do not enter these trials. And so this uh, chart shows you that there are features in the efficacy trials that do not mimic and that are really almost antithetical to what we see in clinical practice. So not surprisingly, our efficacy trials are a beginning of, of knowledge that we need, but not the end of it. How do you measure outcomes? There's a, a range of uh, 
candidates or uh, potential methodologies. I'm just going to go over a couple of them in depression. The bottom line is relatively simple. In most cases, patient self-report will suffice and need not entail a Hamilton or a Montgomery Asbury you know, interview. Lots of data has been collected in that regard. This should not be surprising because, of course, we use subjective reports for lots of key things, such as post-operative pain uh, and other management uh, issues in general medicine. So if, if the, the assumption here is the incentive for the patient is if it's not biasing them in too strong a direction one way or the other, disability or monetary compensation, self-reports are, are usually very, very uh, helpful. Um, when we have done studies, as suggested here, where we compare the clinician and self-report items, that is having them identical in two different scales, they were equivalently sensitive to change. Uh, the nice thing about self-reports is the patient can now monitor their own symptoms. They can also monitor their side effects. They can be cued as to when to report, and they can actually enter their own data on iCloud uh, or in their EPIC system or EHR allowing them to be true participants in uh, their collaborative uh, care. This is the quick inventory of depressive symptoms. It's very analogous to the PHQ. There are a number of other uh, very fine self-reports that measure depressive symptoms. Uh, this is a global measure of uh, frequency, intensity, and side effect burden. It's simply on a Likert kind of scale. Uh, you could actually get away with just the overall burden scale to make it as simple as possible. That's available and can be used not just in depression, but any condition. Let's go ahead then and look a little more carefully at this issue of quality of care and outcomes. And I'm going to show you some data from three different studies. They're all very uh, short synopses of very large, long and uh, expensive studies, but they're informative, and I'm trying to just hit the highlights for you. So the first one is the Texas Medication Algorithm Project. What we did there was we uh, compared treatment as usual. This is in multiple clinics throughout the Texas mental health and mental retardation clinical system. So typically lower SES patients, they either had schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or uh, depression. I'm just going to show you depression, this was the uh, one condition that had the lar largest effect. The other two also had effects that were more modest but statistically significant. And what we did is shown here. This is a, a quarter or every three months we measured outcome, in this case using the inventory of depressive symptoms, clinician rating, the 30-item version. Um, and we began with a, a hefty level of depression, 42. And within the first uh, quarter, with by the end of the first three months, uh, we had exceeded the effect of treatment as usual when we uh, applied algorithm, what we call algorithm plus education. So what was that? Uh, what we did is we, we provided a menu of reasonable options and guidance to physicians with the tools to measure outcome, that is, symptoms and side effects, and a system to promote them uh, uh, promote the increase in dose when side effects were tolerated so as to sharpen the dosing and tailoring it to individual patients. Uh, in the treatment as usual, they just carried on with whatever treatments they would have used and we followed them as a control group. Now this was not randomized by patient, it was randomized by clinic because of course the, do uh, the doctors could either uh, and participate in the algorithm or not, but it was hard to get them to do every other patient treatment as usual versus algorithm. But the bottom line here, uh, as shown in uh, the first quarter, uh, let me see if I can use my little, right here, you see there's a large difference. And what's interesting is it continued to be comparable across the rest of the uh, year. What we were surprised at is that we thought maybe this would continue to go down more sharply. We inquired as to, so this is statistically significant what we found, but uh, it didn't continue to grow. And we asked the question, why did it not continue to grow? And we found in this very under-resourced uh, uh, system 
that when the doctor was thinking about uh, changing the dose of medication, the system automatically promoted him to see the patient in another month rather than in another week. And he did not feel or she did not feel comfortable in deferring that second or third or fourth visit in the next several treatment steps to being a month later. So this is a cautionary note that if you, in fact, are in a busy healthcare system and you implement measurement-based care, you have to make system adjustments so that you can, in fact, implement this, this tool. So we are very happy to see a substantial difference uh, in the first quarter that persisted, but we're a little bit disappointed that uh, the, the uh, subsequent quarters did not show an ever-increasing difference. We showed something very analogous in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, not quite as large, but still statistically significant. The second place that we used measurement-based care was in star D, and we had to do that for clear reasons. What we were being asked to do was to, de to determine what to do if the first treatment didn't work. Well, didn't work has to mean the first treatment was well-delivered and didn't work, as opposed to not very well-delivered and didn't work. So we had to figure out how to, if you will, promote uh, vigorously, without endangering the patient, obviously, um, the provider, here primary care and specialty care providers, um, to raise the dose and hold on long enough so that if, if the patient can have a response or remission, they will have it. So what we did is we said, we asked the, the providers, how long do you normally go before you change treatments if it doesn't work? The answer was two to four weeks. We knew from other research that was way too short. It had to be at least six and preferably eight weeks. Secondly, we were looking for remission as our outcome. That happens after response and it takes longer. So we said, look, we really want you to push the dose. You have 12 weeks to do it, after which you can decide whether you want to put the patient in the follow-up. They've done so well. They can enter follow-up earlier if they've done well or if they've done poorly on to the next step. Uh, because we know for sure then that first step, cytalopram, isn't working. And we did something quite similar to the second and third and fourth steps. And what I'm showing you here is the result of that intervention. So cytalopram, the average dose of exit was 42 milligrams a day. In actual practice uh, in, in the United States at that time, uh, the, the actual dose average was 28 milligrams. Bupropion, we hit 283, the average was 190. Sertraline, the average in the U.S. was 90, we hit 135, and so on. I won't belabor the details. But the point is we had a markedly improved impact on the exit dose, and we can be really relatively sure that when the patient did poorly uh, with a particular agent, it was well-delivered, <clears throat> excuse me, long enough uh, that we can declare the agent as ineffective as opposed to the treatment delivery as being deficient. And that's very important. Now, here again, we're showing you similar kinds of findings, uh, 100 milligrams of nortriptyline. The average was 75 in the U.S. at that time. They did underdose lithium a bit, and they did underdose tranocyclamine, but this, of course, was a drug that was uh, people were not widely familiar with, and they were a little bit jittery in using it. Venlafaxone was strong, but not quite as much as we had hoped. Uh, but again, overall, we're increasing the exit doses very substantially with this measurement-based care uh, kind of approach in STAR-D. Um, the other uh, approach is to give feedback in a different way. This was a report by uh, Gallenberg uh, where the feedback was given with a large number of visits, as you can see, to psychiatric uh, providers and there was a substantial effect of just giving the THQ9 feedback as opposed to no feedback, where 44% of the time the dose was changed, another treatment was added a quarter of the time, and so on and so forth, you can see. So this information where the, where the provider and patient might have been happy enough with okay or better uh, provoked uh, and promoted the notion of being a little more assertive and, and raising the dose when tolerable to get from good uh, to better or even great outcomes. This is a very recent report in the American Journal I want to spend a couple of slides on because it, it's the best study yet of isolating 
the effect of measurement-based care. Um, in measurement-based care in uh, STAR-D and in um, the Texas Medication Algorithm Project, we actually combine the measurement and instructions on what to do along with drug choice guidance or algorithms. What we did, what, what was done here in this uh, single type study in Beijing is they said, look, we want to study measurement-based care separate from the algorithms. So we don't care about the algorithms. We're going to do it in depression. You can choose either paroxetine or mirtazapine. Uh, we don't care. And if the first doesn't work, uh, go to the second and vice versa. And it's a very small study, but a very big effect. They have Lyme degraders, Hamilton outcome, response remission, and a 24-week uh, trial, 12 weeks in measurement-based care. Uh, and what they're trying to do is isolate the measurement-based care process from the algorithm. There's no algorithm, just use one drug or the other, that's it. No menu of reasonable choices. This was a profoundly positive study with a very small M, just 60 in a group. And look at the difference. Response rate, standard care, 63%, 87% in measurement-based care. Remission rates, 28 74%. More of the responders were remitters. That you would expect that if you raised the dose and you had a bigger impact on symptoms. And indeed, if you march through uh, the rest of the slides, we'll see that that's entirely so the estimated weeks to response, standard care, almost 12 weeks, measurement-based care, twice as fast. Weeks to remission, twice as fast, 20 versus 10 weeks. Change in the Hamilton, substantially greater in measurement-based care. Uh, and we'll take one more slide of theirs. And what's interesting is, while they pushed the dose, and they did, the doses were larger, the actual side effect burden was not substantially larger in measurement-based care. So the dose went up, but it went up in a way selectively tailored to individuals. So it wasn't pushing the dose on everybody. It was pushing the dose on people that had selectively were tolerating the drug, but were not gaining the full therapeutic effect uh, that they would expect. So it's really a very clear demonstration of tailoring dose and type and timing to the patient. Some patients taking a lower, slower dose, some, take, some taking a larger, faster dose. But by tailoring it, the overall group outcome is quite satisfactory, better overall response, remission, and actual differential side effect burden. What about the doses? The doses, as I mentioned, were in fact larger in measurement-based care starting at week two. So here's the dosage in milligrams per day. They, they went to amitriptyline equivalents so they could crosswalk between the two drugs, but 106 versus 118 and so on. It, it was, uh, I think, a, a remarkably strong demonstration at eight weeks, 12 weeks, and 24 weeks of differential dosing, better outcomes, the same or less side effects using a measurement-based care kind of approach. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the GAP, the German Algorithm Project, and it's been published in two phases. This is the first phase, a single-site study uh, by Michael Bauer and colleagues. This was a very interesting study. This was on inpatients. In Germany, inpatients can occur a little more readily or substantially more readily than outpatients. So these are, I would say, more severe outpatients or inpatient kinds of depressed patients. They had treatment as usual or uh, a, a standard structured uh, approach with multiple steps and measurement of outcome, very much an algorithm measurement-based care implementation. And as you can see, there's a uh, substantial uh, better onset, statistically significant earlier onset of remission uh, with the SSTR or measurement-based care approach. Um, and the next slide will show you uh, the next slide will show you that there is a cost savings uh, entailed in this as well. So the cost per remission for the measurement-based care was 20,000 euros versus about 40,000 euros for treatment as usual. They went on to do a third GAP-3 project. It's a little complicated, so I'm going to simplify it for you. These are three different kinds of algorithms. SSTR 1, 2, and 3, um, 
and each of these were not different from each other, but they were each and every one of them different from treatment as usual, uh, as well as uh, uh, different from, this is a computer-derived uh, rec set of recommendations. So this is kind of uh, big blue trying to outget the clinicians. This is treatment as usual, and these are the three algorithms in all three cases. The algorithms are all in, in patients. Uh, be the two comparison groups. And finally, very quickly, and then I'll stop for questions, we'll talk about care delivery. This is very important because we're starting to have to allocate care in a very smart, I, I think, and better way, tailoring it or personalizing it to individual patients. And I'll give you just one, uh, yeah, just one example. As you know, in depression, once you hit remission, your outcome is very, very much better than if you get better but not well. This is PayCal's original old study showing the uh, relapse rate in individuals who get better but not well. So they're responder but not remitters, and when they have residual symptoms, they have a relapse, big one. Um, when you, in fact, hit remission, they have no residual symptoms, but over time, about 20% of them actually do also relapse. So the question becomes, in those who have achieved remission, who are the relapsers? And what we did recently was looking at the old database from the Collaborative Depression Study way back in 78, and we asked the, the simple question, in all those who actually remitted, um, let's count some of the symptoms that you still have, very small levels of symptoms, but when you add them up, you get a total score. And what we found was, if you had a substantial number of these symptoms, even though they were clinically remitted, your relapse rate was much, much higher, very much higher when they, these few individuals had a lot of these symptoms. When they had virtually no symptoms, their relapse rate was less than 1 in 20. So this is a very simple clinical tool that can allocate resources so those with higher ratings can be seen more often in follow-up. Those with lower ratings can be seen every, say, four to even six months. And then finally, uh, measurement-based care, because of the numbers that it provides, gives us a tool that I think uh, feed right into the very important need that care system managers need uh, to meet, which is to identify individuals that are doing uh, poorly, to determine whether programs, when plugged in or unplugged, add to the cost or add to the outcome or are cost effective. And the outcomes that you use in measurement-based care are totally aligned with the outcomes that care managers care about. Symptoms, readmissions, uh, function, um, and side effects. So as long as the provider is gathering things that the provider uses to make decisions, we don't need to add a lot of other stuff to satisfy the system managers, and that saves provider time and cost, and it gets the administrators aligned with clinicians' uh, primary outcomes. So the final question, and maybe one to dwell on, is how come we don't use, even in depression, measurement-based care as often as we should? This was a, a survey by Mark Zimmerman that showed that, indeed, there's a kind of attitudes or uh, misbeliefs that are uh, part and parcel of uh, why we perhaps do not uh, engage people with measurement-based care. We don't have very clear evidence of its value uh, clinically as well as uh, um, economically in terms of time. And finally, this is a, a very informative response to a blog put out by uh, the chairman in Hershey, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Psychiatry, who is discussing measurement-based care. And this uh, responder in the blog, you can read it, is uh, having a temper tantrum over measuring too much stuff. I am no proponent of measurement that is useless. I hate measuring stuff that is not actionable. But when we come to clinical decisions and we measure only those things we need to make our decisions as evidence-based as possible, I favor measurement because I think that's the best way to bring science to the bedside and help our patients um, and, and for us to accomplish all of these multiple clinical tasks. But again, parsimonious use of measurements in a timely fashion when clinical decisions uh, have to be made. So I'll stop for questions and conversation. The first um, comment is from Sarah Duffy, 
who says, one of the issues in the substance use disorder field is that we haven't yet agreed on what outcomes we should expect from treatment. There is an agreement that it should have something to do with reducing drug use and improving function, but it isn't like depression where you have many good validated and agreed upon scales. Can you discuss how the depression field came to consensus about what it was they thought treatment should be doing and then agreed on ways to measure it? What a terrific question. I wish I had an hour to answer it. So let me take a shot at this. Um, the, the field of depression had no criteria by which to define syndromes, of course, until 1980 with the DSM. That Because before that, and I actually am one of the probably few surviving psychiatrists that was trained on DSM-1, 2, 3, contributed to 4, and I'm still studying 5. Uh, Bob Spitzer was my teacher way back at Columbia. Um, what we did before we had criteria is we had descriptions, narrative stories, if you will. Uh, psychi psychiatric diagnoses were all reactions to difficulties. Uh, it was along the lines of Adolf Meyer um, that had a huge effect on psychiatry for a long time. So uh, before we got to criteria and syndromal definitions based initially on the finer criteria in 1972 and then as I mentioned, the research criteria in 75, we really would be at, at odds. We would have to say, well, how much drug abuse do you have? Oh, a lot, a little. But, well, then what kind of drug? And is it really interfering with your function or not so much? Or are you in big trouble with the law or whatever? So we would, we would just have a conversation to figure out how big a problem was this, and the patient would describe it, and we would kind of rate it. You know, a really big one, not so big chronic, intermittent, episodic, and that was our diagnosis. And that was a continuous variable. So we would have giant problems or little problems. We have them all the time or some of the time. They'd be interfering or they wouldn't be interfering. Um, and that's what Max Hamilton started with. So what he said was, gee, um, we need to see whether our, our treatments actually affect the most common symptoms. He didn't call it syndrome. Uh, that they present with, but now we know what those symptoms are. In the DSM-5, if you look at SUD, there are 11, 11 items in the syndrome of substance use disorder. Um, you could actually go and create a scale for each of those 11 items, or perhaps easier, reduce them to three or four key items, which would be things like amount of use, quality of life as a result of use, difficulties in employment, difficulties interpersonally, uh, et cetera, economic impact, and you could really have a four or five item scale that has different dimensions, some of which will, re will um, improve very quickly, like symptoms, some of which may improve more slowly, such as function or quality of life or employability, but I think it does give you a metric by which to at least gauge what kind of an outcome are you getting with your treatments. The other element in this is, what is your treatment aiming at? Because when we aim uh, at depression with drugs, we're aiming at symptoms. But when we aim with therapy, sometimes it's symptoms, but sometimes it's risk factors or contributing factors or resiliency or relapse prevention. So we're changing our treatment based on the target we're trying to get. And that might either call for a subscale or a different scale um, and a different time frame. Because as we know, the, the intervention with FUD as well as with depression, it's not all just about symptoms. It's about life and quality and function and risk and overall health. And I think that's part of what uh, Betty and the CTN and NIDA himself was trying to do to distill down to some, some rather basic, not necessarily mandatory, but important scales or metrics that we could use in managing these patients with substance use um, and in order to gauge, A, is our tr treatment actually working? B, should we give up one treatment and go to another? And C, what else do we need to do that maybe we add medications when we haven't or we add therapy when we haven't, et cetera? Um, so I think the field is very, very ripe for this step forward. I think care systems really want to see measurement, and I think part of our job is to guide them on those measures that make the most sense to us clinically and that they can actually embrace 
to better manage the resources we put forth uh, to help our patients. One other comment, um, and depression went through this, which is um, the importance of the significant other person. Uh, this is vital in the management of bipolar disorder, obviously anybody with psychotic symptoms, but also, quite frankly, even in severe depression. Patients have trouble remembering a good day five days ago when they're in the middle of a severe depression and they're seeing you on, let's say, a Thursday. The only way you know that they have had a good prior day in that week is to have another informant come in, and that might be the first clue that the medicine or the therapy that you're giving them is starting to work. But if you rely on them alone, their cognitive biases may prevent them from being objective. Certainly that's true when it comes to a history of manic or hypomanic episodes, and it's quite likely to be true in SUD patients who've had scrapes with the law, hit major interpersonal difficulties they're in denial about, um, or they may simply be ashamed of it, but often they, they just don't see the difficulties they have they don't also recognize the improvements that they may be showing. And that's, again, a very strong argument, I think, for systematic measurement, but also engaging an important collaborator or partner uh, in uh, identifying the problems and implementing the program. And um, Lee Ann Hugh found the uh, statement on the NBC uh, reducing premature attrition very interesting uh, and recommends further evaluation and study in that area. Did you have any comment on that? Uh, yes, I think that the, the problem of attrition, while it's wildly famous in the area of substance use disorders, is a giant secret in the rest of psychiatry. And what I'm saying here is, and recently there was a, um, an article in the American Journal of Psychiatry by Dunlop, the so-called PREDICT study. I did a commentary on that study. They took uh, treatment-naive patients, though they were not treatment-resistant patients with lots of prior uh, episodes of uh, illness and so on, but they were seriously ill, major depressed patients. And what they found was even in offering two medications or a psychotherapy in a randomized trial, they had about a 20% non-engagement rate, that is from evaluation to showing up for the first treatment visit, and another 20% dropout rate or more uh, between the first visit and the last visit. That's the kind of thing that we saw in STAR-D. We did everything to engage the patient. We had brochures, we had extra nurses, we had very committed doctors. We put extra resources into retention, and yet we lost a bunch of patients um, right from the start. The engagement was tricky, and we're offering free treatment, and they could even choose amongst the treatments. Uh, so I think the attrition issue is critical, and getting the patient to align with the clinician and collaborate with the clinician. Here's what we're going to do. Here's our first step. Here's what we expect to see happen. Here's when we expect to see it happen, and you're going to get to tell me if it's happening. I think changes the whole dynamic in the therapeutic relationship from uh, authority to, uh, to an obeyer uh, into a partnership uh, with an exploratory uh, curiosity heightening kind of um, interaction because, to be very frank, we don't know what works very well in most patients. So, we need the patient and us together to collaborate uh, in a little bit of a trial and error approach to see what's best. And I really think that's important in terms of patient engagement and adherence. Follow-up from Leanne, do you think self-rated measurement is necessary to disseminate MBC and SUD care? I think, so. think self-rating is uh, very important because of the psychology that's implicit in it. We're asking the patient to participate in getting better. Um, and we're saying to them the meta message is, we trust what you're telling us. Now, we know that that's not true for all of us as patients, not just psychiatric patients, SUD, whatever. The patient is never fully disclosing to the doctor, regardless of what the doctor thinks. I can speak as a patient as well as a doctor, right? So we, we know that's tr that it's not entirely totally open. but by implying to the patient by behavior, we care about what you're getting. We seriously take your input on 
uh, how the treatment is working. I think that the self-report has a huge value. That is not to mitigate clinical judgment as to the veracity of the self-report uh, uh, or the absence of objectivity by the patient. And that's really why I do think a significant other might be an important intermittent corroborating source of information. Uh, and I think it can be done very, very objectively and very early, even in the course of diagnosis. I personally don't see depressed patients diagnostically unless I can have a significant other also join the conversation because I really believe patients cannot fully appraise themselves of their history, which is often kind of complicated. So that's my short answer. I think self-reports very good, but I think the clinician still has to uh, render objective judgments. First of all, I really like to express our gratitude to John Rush. Thank you so much for such a nice treat before the weekend. Secondly, I want to put a plug in for the next uh, webinar in the series. We have invited our VA colleagues to talk about the FAM, which is one of the measurements that's being considered uh, to be used in the MBC. And uh, uh, afterwards, we have another one, which is on the uh, IT support for um, measurement-based uh, care. After that, we have a um, scientist from the UK who's going to discuss his experience of using MDC for smoking cessation. And we also have a face-to-face -face meeting scheduled in the beginning of September. So I, with all that, let me end the uh, webinar. Thank you for your participation. Any suggestions, questions, send me an email. Be Thai at NIH.gov. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.